At seven o'clock, I'm gonna call uh, the uh, December uh, 14th, November. excuse me, November 14th um, meeting of the Sunderland Planning Board to order. Um, and our first order of business tonight um, is a public hearing on um, proposed uh, zoning bylaw changes. So I'm gonna ask the clerk um, to read the legal notice, please. Sure, we're we reading this whole thing. Um, the Town of Sunderland will hold a public hearing pursuant to uh, Mass General Law Chapter 40A, the Zoning Act, Section 5 on November 14th, 2023, at 7 p.m. at the Sunderland Town Hall, 12 School Street, Sunderland, Massachusetts, and via Zoom um, with the following link. Do I read the no. link? No. Okay. The purpose of this public hearing is to provide interested parties with the opportunity to comment on the proposed revisions to the Sunderland's zoning bylaws. These changes will address standalone battery energy storage facilities and include proposed revisions to section 125 article 1 general provisions 2, definitions to add a definition of accessory battery energy storage facilities and standalone battery energy storage facilities. Proposed revisions to section 125, article two, She's gonna... uh, use and dimension regulations two, use regulations to address accessory and standalone battery energy storage facilities, and proposed revisions to section 125, article four, special regulations, three large scale ground mounted solar and electric installations to incorporate accessory and standalone battery energy storage facilities. Proposed revisions to section 125, article six, administration and enforcement three, special permits to add criterion for assessing the impact on public safety and municipal services and drinking water recharge areas. The complete text of the proposed zoning bylaw revisions is on file with the town clerk at the Sunderland Town Hall, 12 School Street, Sunderland, Massachusetts, and is available for inspection during the regular business hours of the town clerk. And it was submitted by Dana Roscoe to the chair of the Sunderland Planning Board. Thank you, Amanda. So we're going to have um, a brief presentation uh, on the proposed changes, and we just have to uh, allow Allison from the Franklin Regional Council of Governments um, access to share her screen, and she's going to uh, do a PowerPoint presentation for us. There we go. Cool. Welcome, Allison. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks. Of course, do we? Is anyone in the room, or do we just have Larry and Phyllis online? That's it. Just Larry and Phyllis. Okay. And Morgan in the corner doing our AV for us. Okay, great. Well, hello. I'm Allison. I'm a planner with the FERCOG, and I've been working with the Sunderland Planning Board on this bylaw update. So I'll just provide a very brief presentation about the changes um, and provide a little bit of context. So before diving into the specifics of the bylaw update, I just wanted to go over um, what battery energy storage facilities are and what they're used for. On the right here is um, an image of a battery storage system in Holyoke. And the containers shown here are the most common way that the batteries are stored. In that system, the excess energy from the solar array um, is stored by the battery system and then discharged to the grid during the peak grid operating times. And this helps to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels during times of peak demand. Some systems are set up as standalone facilities um, so it's just the containers of batteries with no, no solar arrays um, or they're stored in a different way. Um, the image on the bottom right here is, is from a facility in Provincetown. These systems store excess energy directly from the grid instead of the on-site array. Um, and the, the accessory storage facilities are typically sized just to store the energy that's generated on site. Um, this zoning bylaw update addresses both types of the facilities I just mentioned, so the standalone and um, accessory storage facilities. 
but does not address the residential batteries, you'll still need to um, get local permits for those if you want to install the, their, the, I think the most common ones are those Tesla battery packs. Um, so again, those are not, those are not regulated in this bylaw update. We updated four sections of the bylaw to address battery energy storage facilities. We added definitions for both accessory and standalone facilities, amended the use table to reflect where different types of storage may be cited, amended the large scale ground mounted solar electric installations to address battery energy storage facilities, and then we amended some of the special permit criteria. The, defini the definition updates are pretty straightforward, but I'll provide more detail about the changes to the other three sections in the following slides. Um, so for changes to the use table, the main takeaway here is that any type of battery storage facility, whether it be accessory to a, to a large scale solar array or standalone, it's only allowed in the C2 district, and that's the zoning district up in the northeast corner of the town. Um, it's near Long Plain Road and it is bound by the railroad tracks. Um, so batteries are hazardous materials, so by allowing them in the C2 district, we're not outright prohibiting them, but rather protecting Sutherland's important ecosystems and water resources. Um, putting any type of battery storage facility in the C2 district will require a special permit from the planning board. And I also wanted to note that regulations for large scale solar arrays are unchanged, so long as they don't have any battery components. So a ray sized in between 1,000 square feet and four acres require a special permit in all districts, except for the C2 district where site plan review is required. Um, and a raised, an array size larger than four acres require a special permit in all districts. Um, again, the standalone facilities are only allowed in the C2 district and they cannot be sized larger than four acres. Um, in terms of updating the language included in the large scale ground mounted solar electric installations bylaw, most of the changes were pretty straightforward in that the text now makes references to large scale solar arrays with or without battery storage facilities. Um, some specific changes or some changes that are specific to battery storage facilities include uh, setbacks, so any storage facility must be say at least 750 feet away from any water supply well or septic system. All systems must be fenced and uh, have a, a fence with a minimum of an eight foot height. They also must be contained, so that means that they must be placed on a pad. Sometimes there are um, other components that should also have secondary containment, so we put that language in. We also have a training requirement, so the um, operator or owner of the installation must provide annual training to Sunderland's emergency personnel. Um, this has become pretty standard with these bylaw updates. We saw this in Carver and Medway. Um, it's just important to make sure that the local um, emergency personnel are appropriately trained. And then we also edited the special permit criteria. So we edited one of the criterion to um, indicate that the planning board will also consider how the energy storage facilities will impact drinking water recharge areas in addition to drainage or stormwater management. And then we added a new criterion to note that the planning board will consider um, the facility's impact on public safety and municipal services. So that's a brief summary of the bylaw updates. The next steps for the planning board is to bring the changes to town meeting in the spring. Um, then if passed by voters, they'll submit it to the attorney general's office for review and they must respond within 90 days. Um, and then it be can become an official change in the town. And as Amanda noted, the full text of the revisions are available with the town clerk if you'd like to take a closer look. Um, but with that, we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Allison, for that uh, synopsis of uh, the work that we've been doing on the battery storage, uh, standalone battery storage uh, um, bylaw. I wonder if you could just speak um, briefly about the experience that Wendell had. 
Sure. So earlier this year, Wendell um, worked with the FERCOG to amend their large scale solar um, bylaw to also incorporate accessory battery energy storage facilities in large scale or sorry, standalone facilities. And in their original draft, they sought to outright prohibit them. And when they submitted that to the attorney, attorney's general office, they came back and said that was not allowed because it was not in the best interest of um, the public welfare. Um, we do have uh, some some pretty uh, you know necessary clean energy goals. So I think the the state is trying to balance um, those needs. So we do need to allow. Um, battery storage facilities in some way is really what we learned from that. Right, and so the way that we've addressed it is by allowing it in the C2 district. So it is it is allowed by special permit in the C2 district. And I would, I would just say that this is not um, an abstract or uh, an academic exercise. The town of Sunderland has actually been approached by uh, um, standalone battery storage facility uh, uh, entities that uh, are interested in locating in Sunderland and have approached the town about uh, what their bylaws and restrictions would be. So um, it, 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 it seems like it's in the town's best interest uh, to have a plan in place and not be caught flat-footed and that's why we reached out to uh, Allison and the COG uh, to help us uh, make these uh, proposed bylaw changes. May I ask a question? Absolutely, that's why you're here. Um, to, I guess to Allison, um, the Hadley bylaws, Hadley bylaws right now say um, no freestanding storage facilities just attached to solar that may not make it in the end, but is that a stopgap that Sunderland might be able to use, you know, until the Attorney General figures out exactly <laughs> what they're going to allow and what they don't allow. For right now, doesn't Hadley have, um, uh, isn't Hadley restricting to just ones that are attached to their own um, solar facilities? Um, yeah. yeah so so they're saying that you can have the accessory batteries as accessory storage, but they're prohibiting the standalone facilities. Um, I am. Oh, the go ahead. The, the, they can have a standalone, but it's got to be that the power has to be from. Um, oh, I'm sorry. That is the uh, okay. is an accessory. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, just double checking. Um, I I haven't heard about that. I did read in the paper a couple weeks ago. I know Ken um, from PVPC is is working on that, so I could reach out to him. Do you know if they if that's been approved by the AG or that's what they're considering proposing? Um, I, they already had it, but the new AG is saying let's review these things. So they're, yeah. they're, they're you know they're reviewing that kind of stuff. They are, in fact, that they had said that originally they, the solar, um, the solar array near the near the mall, mm -hmm. but part of it was that it was going to have a storage facility along with it, and it was okay because they had zoned it that way originally, and it hasn't been revisited yet, but it could be because of the new attorney general. That was before mm -hmm. the. <laughs> the, the elections and there was a new attorney general, um, right? So, so it's it's open. but could Sunderland do the same kind of thing? If Ken, who wrote the the Hadley bylaw, and so yeah. uh, Hadley is to to be fair, Hadley is outside um, of the Franklin uh, Regional uh, Council District, so it's not something yeah. that Allison is necessarily up on. But I can touch base. I'll see Ken tomorrow. Sure. I will reach out to him uh, and see what I can find out and get back to you with. Um, with what I learn on on where they're at with Hadley. The other thing I'd, I'd add to that is um, that maybe would be more of a concern if we were considering allowing batteries to be on the um, 
But because we're only allowing batteries in that one industrial district, we might be okay. If the AV came back and said that we need to expand, then, then maybe that would be an approach for the town. Okay. Um, and I'm very happy that in the C2 district, I mean, that's, that's where they're uh, for right now. Um, when they're writing out the law the town. Okay. Um, and I'm very happy that in the C2 district, I mean, that's, that's where they're uh, for right now. Um, when they're writing out the laws there, they were talking about the water sources, um, near drinking water or um, such, you know, does that include if, let's say, there was a property that had a brook that ran through it or a stream? Um, is, should they be putting something in there about those kind of waters if, um, if there were a fire, because this can be a safety hazard? Um, there are some of the gases will actually dissolve in, in any kind of water and uh, could kill wildlife as opposed to drinking or, you know, your septic system or whatever, but it's, you know, like hydrogen fluoride and hydrogen chloride making hydrochloric acid and hydrofluoric acid. So um, I don't know if they want to say anything about other kinds of um, water sources. So, Phyllis, we have um, uh, Ellie uh, on the planning board, and she's also on the Conservation Commission, and she um, was the one that um, asked that we include that language. So, um, Ellie, do you have any comments on Phyllis's suggestion? Um, yeah, that I was mostly focused on the pure drinking water aspects when I proposed adding a setback for facilities to be a certain distance from any water supplies. Um, and I know that anything within the buffer region of a surface, any, any proposed installation that's within the buffer zone of a stream or wetland or vernal pool um, would have to be reviewed and approved by the Conservation Commission. So that would automatically give us a, depending on the type of water feature, it would give us 100 to 200 foot buffer right there. Um, and so I guess that, that is a good question though, if we want to consider it farther, I'm not sure that would be necessary. Is there a concern? Only if, they, only if they take it out of the C2 district. You know, I'm thinking of a lot of places yeah. that, that you know, open fields, you know, for agriculture or whatever, and have works running through them and, you know, that type of thing. So I guess if it were rejected from the Attorney General and came back and said, you, you have to do more, you have to go into rural residential, um, maybe you could add more at that point. Yeah, and I think that's a good idea because on the one hand you could say, oh, well, the CONCOM would never allow something near a stream, but you never know what's going to happen in the future. So to have it in writing is not a bad, like to codify it somewhere is not a bad idea. So just procedurally talking, um, we will present this to town meeting in April. If town meeting approves it, it goes to the AG. If the AG rejects it, then we're back at square one. So nothing, we don't do any kind of horse trading with the AG. If you do this, then you can do that. It's, it's either all or nothing. Either the AG approves it or the AG denies it and we come back uh, and take another bite of the apple, which is what they're doing in Wendell right now. There, there, something's been approved in Wendell that um, the citizens are, there, there's like some groups that are trying to, to block it because they're clear cutting forests and um, in order to make the facility and uh, it's too, they think it's too close to residential, which especially in Sunderland, being in one of those things, um, they have an apartment complex and a lot of them are to the rural residential areas. Um, so I don't know if you need stronger language on, on how close it can be to um, a heavily uh, populated residence area, like a, you know, even though you on how close it can be to um, a heavily uh, populated residence area, like a, you know, even though you said it's in C2, if it comes out anything about how it's be from, are they going to, uh, you know, is somebody going to turn around and say, oh, well, you could put it here. Other thing about the Wendell project I should mention is so the, the project um, installation that 
Um, so the, the company was Conservation Commission, but the Conservation Commission was not to grant them a permit. And then um, they made a wholesale exemption. That, um, so the, the company was Conservation Commission, but the Conservation Commission was not to grant them a permit. And then um, they made a wholesale exemption from the town zoning bylaw. So they're 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 going straight to the DPU and um, so um, yeah, yeah that's here in Sunderland. And what, sorry? Could that happen here in Sunderland if they do the same? You know, if a proposal came in, and he says that there's that was one of the first questions I was going to ask is has anybody you know <laughs> approached Sunderland about this? And he says um, Dana says yes. So you know, I'm concerned that we fall into the same problems that Wendell is falling into if, if the, the, the wording isn't in place really strongly before it's passed by town meeting. So Allison, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, the issue in Wendell is they tried to close uh, the barn door after the cows had left. Basically, the, the petitioner got their uh, submission in and then Wendell tried to install a bylaw which the AG rejected, um, regardless of the issue of, so in the absence of a bylaw prohibiting it, they're going directly to the DPU. Uh, contrast that with Sunderland where we have no active, uh, 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 we have interest, we do not have any active application for an installation. So if we were to have an approved bylaw uh, that would um, restrict it to the C2, uh, I don't believe that could be appealable to the DPU. Yeah. But is, could somebody come in before the town meeting and put a, an official proposal in? No. One, one, once, once we post our first legal notice, which was two weeks ago, then it's as though the, the bylaw has been adopted. The clock just stops from two weeks ago until the AG acts on this. Excellent. Good for you. Good for you. Excellent. Uh, the Larry part of Larry <laughs> Phyllis said uh, you know, a couple of questions. Um, the the granting of um, or the establishment of criteria for the planning board covers uh, several issues, um, tr which are great. And my question is. Uh, a couple examples. Let's say, well, one example, potential fiscal impact is huge on somewhat untested hazardous technology with a life expectancy at this time of about 20 years. Um, I've seen bylaws written an example of the town of Abington, which requires decommissioning funding established in advance. And with, and with that noise as a public health issue, these things that can be noisy, but criteria can be written specifically to deal with that. And I have an example of that. The training for first responders is apparently, what I'm told, uncovered, which is great. But costs can rise rapidly for things like evacuation plans. Um, already in the United States, evacuations of a mile this year have been required because of accidents at best facilities. Shelter in place orders, which were put in, in at least one incident, which require good communication systems within the town and they have to be that all of it has to be funded and established what I meant so we could say that under the 
the sort of criteria that the planning board has the right to consider, as it's put here, a potential fiscal impact. My question is, is it appropriate at this time to get specific rather than have the applicants, lawyers, come in sort of ahead of us and fight? Does that, does the question make sense? I understand what you're saying, Larry. Just I know you have something about um, if the, when the facility is abandoned and, and that kind of stuff. Yeah, that, I'm just I, looking for that if line. The thing was, if, if it catches on fire, it, most likely they're going to abandon it. And if you don't have funding set up to fix it, then you could take the property, but you still got you still got to pay to clean it. Is there, you know, like uh, Abington did something to try to make it in their in their proposals for um, for zoning to to actually have funding in place. Okay, so here's here's our language. Uh, it says removal requirements. Any large-scale ground-mounted solar electric installation and or battery energy storage facility that has reached the end of its useful life or has been abandoned consistent with subsection 125 VK abandonment or decommissioning shall be removed. The owner or operator shall physically remove the installation within 150 days of abandonment or the proposed date of decommissioning. And if not, the town retains the right after receipt of an appropriate court order or uh, otherwise duly authorized by law to enter and remove an abandoned hazardous decommissioned large-scale ground mounted solar electric installation or battery energy storage facility as a condition of site plan or special permit approval an, a, an applicant shall agree to allow entry to remove an abandoned or decommissioned installation. The cost of the removal will be charged to the property owner in accordance with the provisions of MGL 139-3A as a tax lien on the property. The owner or operator shall notify the planning board by certified mail of the proposed date of discontinued operation and plans for removal. Decommissioning shall consist of physically removing the uh, whatever, disposal of all solid and hazardous waste, uh, stabilization or revegetation of the site, restoration of designated prime ag land to a condition suitable for resumption of agricultural uh, production. And it goes on. There's the, uh, and then to your point, Larry, uh, bullet number three says financial surety, uh, proponents of large-scale ground-mounted solar electric or battery energy storage facilities shall provide a form of surety either through escrow account or other form of surety approved by the select board to cover the cost of removal in the event the town must remove the installation and remediate the landscape in an amount and form determined to be reasonable by the select board, but no event exceed more than 125% of the cost of removal and compliance with additional requirements set forth herein, blah, 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 blah. So this, the whole bylaw is available um, from Wendy, and you can um, read this language, but I, I think we, we have... You know, you, you had me at S. Well. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's, thank you very, very much. Sure. Uh, once you guys walk, but <laughs> not my, uh, not my nature. Uh, so, uh, I, terrific. I would. Uh, that's that's sort of the big stuff. Um, I think we all have concerns about our first responders and uh, the cost associated with anything there. Um, but um, I'd like the escrow because that covers the chain, possible change of ownership of the property. It also covers the fact that whoever the applicant might be, in appearance it might be some, you know, sub-corporation somewhere, and that's, that's very good. Um, just bring up once again the noise, um, uh, and for example, I'm not pushing Abington, but 
their rate they they cite a specific of a one hour average of 60, 60 de decibels at the outside wall of basically the nearest occupied building um, things like that could be possibly helpful so we say noise generated by a large-scale ground-mounted solar electric installation or battery energy storage facility and associated equipment and machinery shall conform to applicable state and local noise re regulations, including DEP's Division of Air Quality Noise Regulation 310 CMR 710. A source of sound will be considered in violation of said regulation if the source increases the broadband sound level by more than 5 dB uh, A above ambient or produces a pure tone condition when an octave band center frequency sound pressure level exceeds 2 adjacent center frequency sound pressure levels by 3 decibels or more. Uh, and this goes on. There's there's um, uh, four more bullet points um, just dealing Sounds with. Sounds like you have it covered. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Everything looks great. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Appreciate your patience. And uh, I I, I um, appreciate your vigilance and your um, your. Uh, persistent, <laughs> <laughs> persistent attendance. Yeah, it wasn't for us, who else you got tonight, anyway? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks for coming and asking good yeah. questions. Well, in, in, just in terms of communication and someone, um, this could have gone out by by the email or you know that the notification of it um, was only in the paper no, I think and not the against the newspaper. We didn't get we didn't get an email. We didn't get anything other than we saw it in the paper right so so this is we're we're in november now and town meeting is in april so if there if there is absolutely an opportunity for us to do an additional outreach if you feel that it's warranted and we would be happy to do that okay i think i'm just saying i think that's the the only reason that I think I'm the only one who looks through the legal notices, but you know, um, but there are other ways in Sunderland to, to get it. You know, you could, you know, they, they um, not everybody gets the notifications for um, the planning board or the board of health or the selectmen, you know, just by on a list, um, but they could send it out to. Um, to a general email list, right? To say yep. there's a you know there's something coming up and it's you know this is the the, the topic of it. You know, I, I find them just like I said. I think I'm the only person who actually sends reads all the legal notices every day and uh, picks them out. But so this has been the center of our universe for the last uh, six or seven months. This is all we've been talking about. So we we would be overjoyed if this room was full of people that shared our our interest in this topic. But um, it, it really isn't very sexy. So. Uh, <laughs> No, it, it, it's not like uh, not not like when we did the the red light district. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> that would have got more more people showing up. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you guys for coming. We're going to say good night. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. And if there are no other public comments, then I think we can um, close uh, the public hearing. Allison, thank you very much for your, um, for your help uh, throughout this process and for your excellent presentation tonight. Yeah, thank you all. It's been great to work with you all, and um, I hope things go well at town meeting in the spring. Um, if, you, if you need help with outreach or anything like that, I'd be happy to hop on it. I'm sure other towns are going to be looking for this type of assistance as well. Perfect. And and like I, I told Phyllis, I will reach out to Ken uh, tomorrow and I will share with you uh, what 
I learn about the Hadley situation because honestly, I know nothing about it. Yeah, I just saw something a couple weeks ago, so any update from Ken would be great. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks again. Thank you. Thanks, Good night. Bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. Perfect. So I, I actually, I never saw uh, David. Yeah, I didn't either. Um, so I guess he got, he said he was going to try and make yeah. it, but I guess he got preoccupied and we knew that Doug was not going to be joining us tonight. Yeah. Um, there is the town center committee meeting tomorrow. Yeah. Uh, and the, the engineering firm that they have hired is going to, be here and they specifically requested planning board um, participation so I will be there and Doug said he will be there so I don't know if either of you were interested in that or not yeah but I'm gonna be there too Great. Um, Wendy told me to take minutes if we had a quorum is that true oh if there's three of us so so it, but we won't have taken any votes so okay. it's very perfunctory, you know, okay. these three members were in attendance and, you know, no. Perfect. The, the consultant presented this information and, yeah. and the planning board took it under advisement. Okay. I can do that. And then with this, with the notes for this, do I write, like I wrote down the questions they asked. Do I include those in the minutes? Um. Mm. So how does this, uh, this tape work after tonight? Will it ever get played again? Does it, is it on a loop or? <laughs> it's airing, but um, usually Jonathan will store it in with the other archive uh, collections that we have. And so it, it, if someone wanted access to it, if, if they went to Wendy and said, can we see the, the public hearing, then Wendy would know how to get in touch with you guys and, yes. and, and that could be arranged. Mm -hmm. Perfect. So I can just write that? Yeah. So did the zoning board, uh, switching gears yeah. to do our updates, did the zoning board get involved with uh, the uh, dope shop uh, changing owners? I have not been informed with anything about that. I, I read about it in the paper that, okay. that there's a new owner from Watertown or the something. The one in Sunderland? It, the, right, the, the one that so you guys have already had a hearing yeah. because it required a special permit yep. and you I think you granted it we proved it yeah yeah but now now whoever you you granted it to is no longer the owner so oh. I'm just wondering oh. and I read that in the paper that okay that it was uh, some kind of family construction company interesting uh, from uh, just outside of Boston that, yeah um, is mm. the new owner of it so it's not Cheech and Chong <laughs> <laughs> I just read that in the paper I, I could not believe the line the line was all the way around they had police details yeah. on both sides of the building the line of people standing uh, to get in was all the way so there's that veranda yep. and then out into the parking lot and it said in the paper today that you had to have paid uh, or agreed to pay uh, buy a hundred dollars worth of merchandise in wow. order to get a ticket to see them. So, I just heard about the traffic that was around yeah. there. Yeah, that's crazy. It was crazy. Um, I will ask about it. I haven't heard anything about it. I know that when that meeting was over, um, they had stated that there was like a really long road ahead of them before they could even start construction okay. because of the like the approval process. But yeah. they the people that came before us they've they own a bunch of them uh -huh. so they're very well versed in yeah you know, what needs to happen but i'll ask i haven't the zba has been quiet we haven't met or anything all right and what's happening with um 325 amherst road ellie 
So I got uh, an email from Jennifer today saying that she had been out and met with the, uh, with the property owner uh, and determined that there were no vernal pools or um, other. Uh, so um, Warner Brothers or Allstates is, is buying property adjacent to their property. Okay, to, I had to, to leave fix. the CONCOM meeting early because we had a really long meeting and I had my son with me. Oh. So I missed that part. Okay. So apparently they're trying, they're trying to fix uh, a drainage problem on an, on a property that they own. Okay. So, so they bought the property next door to, to absorb it. the problem that they have. And, okay, yeah, and so they want to come to the planning board sometime in the next couple months to do an A&R and, and put the properties together as a single okay. property. So okay. that's the only planning board involvement. But the, all of the emails that I was seeing from Jennifer seemed to say that she had no problems at all with what they were proposing. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That was right when I was leaving. Okay. So, I'm sorry. Sorry. <laughs> sorry to put you on the spot. It's okay. And, and while you were there, did anything else come up? Um, well, the reason why it took so long was that we had um, somebody from Mass Wildlife present on the new biomap layer because they update, this is the third update, I think, of the biomap layer on Mass GIS. And she went through like some background on the, the this latest update is only uh, less than a year old. And, okay, I'm sorry, it's the second update. The first one was 2001. And um, she went through different aspects of the biomap layer and priority habitat and um, went, looked a little bit, looked at like what's online in general, but then also what's specific to Sunderland as far as the layers and um, what we can learn from the biomap layers in Sunderland. And I actually wondered if the planning board would want to hear her presentation at some point. She's doing outreach to concoms and planning boards. And where is she from? She's from Mass Wildlife. And so where is her office? Um, Westboro, but the presentation was Zoom. remote. Yes. Okay. Yes. So I don't think it's urgent at all, but I thought it was interesting and if people want to know more. I think when you speak to the CONCOM, most of the people are relatively familiar with the biomap layer. Yeah. And maybe the planning board isn't, like, like maybe not every member is as familiar so with it. So uh, how about if we put this on the agenda again next month so when yeah. we have a full complement, we can discuss it? Yeah. Okay. That was the big part of it. I know that the they've made progress removing the fill off of Russell I Street. I would say it's between a quarter and a third of the flat pile is still left the last she time I went a by. On a pretty small <laughs> excavator. <laughs> a pretty small excavator. Um, but I that was over a week ago that I went by, so I don't know if it's quite done and. I think they also talked about that after I had to leave at the Conservation Commission. But the neighbors were not at the meeting, so that's oh. probably a good sign. That is a good sign. Yeah. So progress is being made. Yeah, I think progress is being made. Good. Yeah. That's good. All right, the, the two, um, is it one or two outstanding projects that um, are lingering. One is Cozy Corners. I haven't heard um, anything hmm. uh, on Cozy Corners. And then there, I guess there's been uh, some outreach from the uh, owner of um, Sugarloaf Estates uh, regarding the, uh, the undeveloped uh, lot and what, what potential uses could happen there and that's something that we have discussed um, at length um, in the past so yeah do you know um, I saw that the property we discussed it before because there was a potential they wanted to do like a storage 
facility, I thought, like heading out of town okay. towards Bub's Barbecue, the heading property south, on the right side. Like near Plum Tree? Right. So he came and met with us, remember? Mm -hmm. He, he, um, he, his father or someone in his family ran KSE, uh, and, or maybe he did, and he yeah. didn't want to do that anymore. There were, yeah. he, he said that storage was more lucrative, so he was, because we met with those uh, scientists from UMass yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. that were um, using cotton and yeah. uh, making something out of cotton, energy or something oh, out yeah. of cotton, yeah. uh, mm -hmm. and he was going to evict them and yeah. just turn that um, structure into storage, and he wanted to have additional storage on, on that property. Remember, he wanted to put an access road yeah. Um, off from the uh, driveway uh, to the church. Yeah. Uh, and we told him that no. that's not a public way. So mm -hmm. um, he was just going to do something um, from his existing curb cut. So yeah. do you think something's happening there? Well, not, I don't know if it was that. It's the house. The, um, the White House, north of, is that what you're going to ask? Them? Yeah, they just renovated the White House. The one where they had the barn and they, and had they it for changed sale. the, didn't you change the zoning of it? We because did. people wanted to have weddings? Yeah, that, weddings. Yes. That's what they yes. yeah, yeah, sold. Yeah. It just sold, so it I was just, just curious. Sold. Huh. Because um, I know someone had talked about some, like doing something with the property previously, but huh. I was just curious. No, I, I, so. I don't know. Uh, I was being nosy. I don't know. I, I was being nosy. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know who the owner is yeah. or what. They, the they did beautiful work on the house before it sold. Yeah. It, you know, it turned out yeah. really nice, that renovation. It so did. I'm happy. Yeah, that. it's it's a very historic property. Is that, didn't they talk about moving the house or something? They had asked whether or yeah. not what, what would be some potential buyer had asked yeah. about moving the house. So I don't wow. know if it's this owner or... Huh. Wow. Yeah. Just curious. Um, there hasn't really been anything in the mail either. Just like the normal notices around for fences or what have you. Nothing crazy. Nothing exciting. Right. Is there anything else? I can't think of anything right now. What was the you got notification for this, Elian email? Yeah, on October sixteenth. And so I subscribe to a couple yeah. listserv listserv, like the couple of the yeah. interest groups. I I'm guessing it was the select board one, but maybe okay. I'm in a general one too. I will um, talk to Jeff. I'll see him tomorrow. So okay. I'll ask him yeah. what more we can do to okay. uh, solicit uh, interest. I mean, we don't have to have another formal public hearing yeah. because we made no changes. Mm -hmm. There were no yeah. proposed changes. But, it, you know, as a... Um, effort to mm -hmm. make anyone that missed it uh, aware of what yeah. it is that we're doing. We could definitely um, do some kind of less formal, you know, yeah. just downstairs at our regular Zoom meeting. Exactly, we yeah. could do another yeah. update in January or February. Okay. But if, if there was some way that we could make everyone yeah. aware that that was going to happen. And then, besides that, we just are going before the time. Right, because there was no there was no proposed change yep. to what. So if we changed what our draft language was, yeah. that would trigger another uh, public hearing. But we didn't change. So that's it. So great. We we've met all the requirements, and we're good for. Um, town meeting, but what I'm suggesting is we go above and beyond the yeah. requirements and just uh, try uh, just to do meeting. another outreach.
So that's all I've got for tonight. The minutes look good. Minutes look good, and yes. I I just uh, would rather um, wait until sure. we've got a full board because I don't think anyone's waiting for them uh, down in Wendy's office. So uh, if we just do uh, October and November at our December meeting, if we can yeah. get more than three people, sure. So that we have. Should we look at the date of the December meeting? What is the second Tuesday in December? The 12th. Seems good. Yep. Yep. At 7 o'clock? 7 o'clock, yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right, guys, if there's nothing else, I'll close the meeting. Seven. Happy Thanksgiving to everyone. Yeah, happy Thanksgiving.